Isomorphism literally means same space. You can think of it as like a synonym. We say that V is isomorphic to another space, W. This transformation requires three conditions. First of all, T is linear, T is a bijection, and the inverse transformation is also linear. A bijection means that the transformation is injective and surjective. And if you watched my previous video, you would know this implies a square matrix with ones in every single column and row. This means that the matrix of this transformation is invertible. This implies there exists an inverse transformation that goes from W to V in the opposite direction that undoes our transformation. In vector spaces, you only need to check the first two properties. Lastly, isomorphisms can only occur between finite dimensional vector spaces, not infinite dimensional spaces. If we know a transformation is isomorphic, this means that if we know any basis for V, if we apply the transformation to this set of vectors, we'll get a basis of our codomain. Next, let's go over a few properties. If V is isomorphic with W, this is only true if the dimension of V is the same as the dimension of W. This follows from the fact that in order to be isomorphic, the transformation from V to W must be bijective, which is only true when the dimension of the domain and the codomain are equal. Next, if the dimension of V is n, V is isomorphic with Rn. This is actually called a coordinate isomorphism. Let's say Vi's are a basis of V. The coordinate isomorphism, often represented by a C sub, the basis we're talking about, this would form a standard basis of Rn. So Ei would be all zeros, except the i component would be a one. The point of this is that any vector in V can be rewritten as a linear combination of these Bs, and their coefficients become the coordinates of the vector in Rn. But we'll get more into these details later. Lastly, if the transformation from V to W is an isomorphism, this is true if the transformation is injective, meaning that the kernel of the transformation is just the zero vector, or the transformation is onto. Because the dimensions are equal, we have to have a square matrix. If we see the transformation is injective, this means we must have a leading one in each column. And if we have a leading one in each column, this also means we have a leading one in each row, so the transformation is also surjective. And another way to say injective is one-to-one. -one. This means that it's only necessary to check either injectivity or surjectivity. You don't have to check both properties as one implies the other. Lastly, before we get into some practice, isomorphisms are an equivalence relation. This means it's reflective, so a vector space V is isomorphic with itself by the identity transformation. It's symmetric if V is isomorphic with W, W is isomorphic with V, and it's transitive. If U is isomorphic with V and V is isomorphic with W, U is isomorphic with W. Let's check if this transformation from M22, 2 by 2, two, two matrices, to R4 is isomorphic. What does an isomorphism mean again? First of all, the transformation must be linear. We have two options for this. We could either confirm it is closed under scalar multiplication and addition, or we can see if we can generate a matrix that represents this transformation, as all transformations that can be represented by a matrix are linear. Secondly, we need to show it is bijective. Again, we have multiple ways of approaching the problem. If we found the matrix of the transformation, we can show that this matrix is invertible. In other words, the determinant is not zero. We could also show that the transformation is injective, meaning that the kernel of the transformation only contains the zero vector of our domain, which in this case would be zero, 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 zero. We could also show surjectivity, that the image of the transformation is the entire codomain. Or lastly, we could show that a basis of M22, for example, we could use the standard basis, when we apply the transformation to a basis, any basis of M22, we get a basis of our codomain, R4. As you can see, there's many ways to approach the question and prove that this transformation is isomorphic or show it's not. For this question, let's go with finding the matrix of the transformation and checking the determinant to see if our matrix is invertible. 
In order to find the matrix of a transformation, we need to be going from R, R4 to R4. In this case, we're starting in M22, but we need a column vector in order to multiply correctly. So let's say, luckily we know that M22 is isomorphic because it's four dimensional, it has to be isomorphic with R4. This is coordinate isomorphism. For example, if we were to write 1000 in R4, this would be 1000. If we have a matrix A, B, C, D, this is isomorphic with A, B, C, D, or we could write it in the other form. Okay, let's fill this in. A, B, C, D. And now we need to find what matrix we multiply by in order to get the transformed version of X. We're looking for A and B as our first entry. So let's write a one and a one, and then zero, zero. Because when we do the multiplication, row times column, we'll get A times one plus B times one plus zero C plus zero D. So that's how this works. We imagine A, B, C, D and write a one accordingly. Next, we want to generate a D. So we're going to put all zeros and a one in the final column, like so. Since we can represent this transformation by a matrix, we say that it is linear. Next, let's find the determinant of this matrix to check if our matrix is invertible. To find the determinant, let's expand along the third row. First, we should write negative one to the exponent row three, column three. So three plus three, which is even. So we'll just end up with positive one, then times one. Then let's write out our new matrix. Next, we can expand along the second row. All this is just one. So next we have negative one to the exponent row two, column three, five. And now we do one times negative one minus one times one. The determinant of our matrix A is two, which is not zero. Therefore, we can confirm that our transformation is bijective, which means that our transformation is isomorphic. Let's define an isomorphism from P5, the set of polynomials with degree at most five, to V, which is three by three matrices, where the transpose is equal to the matrix. What does this look like? Transposition means flipping the columns and the rows. If we have an element in the top right corner, when we transpose the matrix, it'll go to the bottom left corner. In order for the transpose to be equal to the matrix, the elements across the diagonal have to be equal. This is another way of saying symmetric matrices. Let's check that the two dimensions are equal. The dimension of P5 is six, and the dimension of V, all the matrices in V are in this format, and this will have a dimension of six, as there are six variables. We're looking for a transformation where x to the exponent five becomes the identity matrix. Remember that with isomorphisms, if we pick any basis in our domain, in this case P5, and we transform it, we will get a basis in our codomain. So let's pick a basis of P5. The standard basis would be the easiest. We already know that the transformed version of X5 is the identity matrix. And next, let's define the transformations for each of the other elements in the basis. We just have to make sure that all of these transformations generate a vector that's independent. We could say X4 gives us the matrix with a one in the top left corner. X3 gives us a matrix with a one in the middle. We just have to make sure that all of these matrices that we're generating are actually in the set of V, so they have to be symmetric. Could we put a one in the bottom left corner for our next matrix? Well, no, because then we wouldn't have independent, as we could add together these three matrices and get the identity matrix. In order to span our entire vector space, we need to have elements outside of the diagonal. And if we add a one, we have to match it on both sides. And there's no right or wrong way to do this. I just picked as simple matrices as possible with as many zeros as I could. Once we set how this transformation will work, let's try it out with a general matrix in P5. Px, if this is a general matrix, we can rewrite this as ax to the 5 plus bx to the 4 plus cx to the 3 plus dx squared plus ex plus f. Since this is a linear transformation, we can rewrite this. Now we know the transformed version of each of these polynomials, so we can just plug that in. Next, we can simplify our right side by making this into one big matrix. And we have now found our isomorphism, where if we plug in x to the exponent five, we'll get a is one, the identity matrix, as all the other variables will be zero. 